You're listening to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, Episode 73, Building the World's First Free Market Country, with guest Roger Veer. Let's go. What's up and welcome back to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, Ash, and we've got a really interesting topic today. Our guest, Roger Veer, and I chat about the idea of creating your own country, or better yet, a free society that has no centralized authority and runs completely on free market principles. Those of non-aggression, property rights, competition, win-win scenarios that create wealth only through voluntary action. Like many of you, I've thought about this idea of what if we had our own country to go to, to show the world what it's like to live in peace and to not force people to pay taxes or to support a school system that they disagree with or to force people to go to war or what what it's even like to have a society that doesn't use force to organize itself. Roger and some of his peers and investors have decided that the time is now and they found several nation states that are highly in debt, which all nation states are, who would be willing to sell them a piece of land where they can create their own country or as Roger calls it, a non-country. So they can build a society based on their own principles, the principles of non-aggression. But I hope that free society The non-country gives us not only an opportunity to go and build the type of world we want to live in, but as an example to show people what it's like and what freedom really does. You know, I use this hashtag, build freedom, a lot, and I truly mean it because it didn't matter how many times I went out on Washington or signed a petition or donated to a campaign that wasn't building. Roger's taking this to the next level and trying to build a country or a free society where like-minded individuals can go and still work and build their own freedom without the restrictions of the state. I'm really excited. I hope you are too. If you appreciate this episode, please share it. I'd love to help as much as possible to get this idea out into the wild to help people understand and give them a shining example of what a free society sounds like in theory and hopefully in a few years looks like in implementation and practice. Without further ado, let's get into the show. So welcome back to Liberty Entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Ash, and I've got a really special guest for you today, Roger Veer. He's an early investor in Bitcoin and crypto-related startups, including the Bitcoin Foundation, Blockchain.info, Ripple, Kraken, BitInstant, BitPay, Purse.io, you name it, many more. He's been a prominent supporter of Bitcoin adoption and sees cryptocurrencies as a means to promote economic freedom. He identifies as a libertarian and a narco-capitalist, peace advocate. He advocates for individualism, voluntarism, and the Free Ross campaign. Shout out to Lynn and Ross Ulbricht. Roger, welcome back to Liberty Entrepreneurs. Thank you for such a great introduction. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so, Roger, I know you've been on a couple times. Longtime listeners will know who you are, but just give us a, just a short background of who you are and how you develop this set of guiding principles of volunteerism. Yeah, so I, I guess at the moment I'm, I'm most well known for my involvement in Bitcoin, but it was because of these first principles that I had that made me interested in Bitcoin. And I suppose those principles were developed from reading lots and lots of books. So I, I guess if there's one piece of advice I can give people today is read books. Um, if you think about it, you know, books are, are written by some of the, you know, the greatest minds in human history. So when you read a book by one of these great, you know, intellectual titans, it's almost as good as if you were able to get and sit there with them for hours and hours and hours and just soak up the information because these people were kind enough to put down their thoughts into a book for the entire world to read. So, you know, I can't count how many times I've been reading a book and I thought, wow, I, I, that never occurred to me before. I never saw it that way before. You know, you have 
bring these new ideas, etc. So the more books you can read, it's, it's just like you're getting to spend time with, you know, the greatest minds in, in humankind. And you're getting to have like a one-on-one -on -one tutoring session from these people. So what a, what a fantastic opportunity. So uh, it was from reading these books that uh, I went from being, I guess, just kind of your general politically agnostic person that didn't have much interest in politics or economics at all. And the more books I read on economics, the more I realized that the entire world's rate of economic growth is being held back by government's intervention into the economy. And growing the economy across the world raises everybody's standard of living. So if you want to help people, the best way you can possibly do it is through more economic freedom and the economic growth that it creates. And so the more of these books I read, the, the bigger an advocate I, I became of those sorts of things. And then when cryptocurrencies came along, I thought, you know, Eureka, here's finally, you know, the tool that we have to bring more economic freedom to the entire world. And by bringing more economic freedom to the entire world, we increase the rate of economic growth of the entire world. And by increasing the rate of economic growth of the entire world, we help every single human being on the planet. And that's what motivated me to get involved in, in Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And that's why I'm still involved today, because this improves the lives of every single human being on the planet. And a rising tide raises all ships, including my own. So, uh, what, what a wonderful thing to be uh, involved in. Yeah, it's pretty amazing that people always talk about, especially in the United States, the freedom of religion or the freedom of speech, but nobody talks about the freedom of money. And you know, whenever I was listening to Ron Paul back in 2000, 2000, I mean, 2007, 2008, he said something that money was half of every transaction. And at the time, it really didn't click with me back then. But now that I've studied more and read more books, you know, money is half of every transaction. And if we don't have the freedom of money, you know, money is a form of communication and it really hinders our personal wealth growth. But also, like you said, the overall economy and the people that gain the most from the freedom of money are, are the poorest people, you know, because the rich can always find ways or loopholes or hire attorneys to get around regulations or taxes or whatever. But when you don't have the freedom of money, it really disproportionately hurts the poor. So that's exactly why I got into Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies as well, because I saw it as just another pillar of individual freedom. You know, I know that you read socialism back in high school, and I'm sure you didn't read this in a public school. How did you pick socialism or how did that come on your radar? So it was just kind of a, I guess a bit of luck and uh, I guess also in part because of my grandfather. So the actual story behind it is that it was summer vacation between maybe eighth grade and freshman year in high school, I would guess, or maybe between seventh and eighth grade. And uh, my mother told me I wasn't allowed to play any more video games. I had to find something to do other than video games that day. And uh, so I went and looked on the bookshelf and uh, thought, I guess I'll read a book and had no idea what sort of book I was looking for. But one of the books that was sitting on the bookshelf was Socialism by Ludwig von Mises, who my grandfather had given to my mother, but my mother never bothered to read it. And when I picked up the book, I thought it was a pro-socialism book, and I didn't really even know what socialism was at that point, but I kind of had this general understanding that Americans are supposed to be opposed to socialism, so... But I, I thought, well, I should at least hear the other point of view and hear the other side of the story. So when I started reading it, I... I genuinely believed it was a pro-socialism book. And when you, by the time you're done reading the book, you realize that, that prices and money do transmit information and they transmit the information as to what resources should be used to produce what consumer goods. And without that information being allowed to flow freely around the world, resources are not allocated as optimally as they otherwise would have been. And so anytime governments interfere with prices or the flow of capital, they're retarding the rate of economic growth of the entire world. So by the time I, I read this book I, I realized that or I thanks to getting this you know had spent hours and hours of one-on-one -on -one tutoring with one of the greatest economic minds in history Ludwig von Mises who was I think already dead at the time I was reading his book um, I, I realized that not only does socialism not be a, it's not actually a good idea it's impossible for it to actually work in practice right. so uh it, it cannot work, period. So uh, it really was a big eye opener for me. And then from there, I kind of, I guess my, my love for economics was born and I picked up one economics book after another and, and read kind of everything I could get my hands on for the next, I don't know, decade and a half or so there and really, really uh, enjoyed it and still enjoy reading about uh, economics to this very day. Yeah, let's let's start talking about free society. You know, you can't have a free society without a market-based economy. You know, free society is your, I think you call it a non-country but at the uh, Aspen conference here recently, and man, I really 
wish that I was there at that one, but you, you made a presentation. I think everybody was expecting you to talk about Bitcoin cash, but you came out and surprised people with this free society, you know, idea. What is free society? Is it a country? Is it, a, you know, and how did you get the idea for it? And how long have you been thinking about this idea of free society? Well, we've been thinking about, I think every libertarian type person has been thinking about this for, for decades and decades or since, you know, they first were exposed to the ideas of, of individual sovereignty. Um, but it really started to come together maybe within the last year, uh, mainly due to uh, Olivier Janssen's was the main driving force behind it. And then he reached out to me a few months ago and said, do you want to be involved? And I said, of course, this is right. something that I've been interested in for, for decades. And uh, the general idea is to bring together a large amount of capital and just plain buy sovereignty for a piece of land from an existing government somewhere around the world and set up the world's first free society based on the non-aggression principle and individual rights. And uh, for anybody that's read uh, David Friedman's book, The Machinery of Freedom, which I read back as a teenager or a high school student, and it was not assigned reading from, from the school, that's for sure. <laughs> but um, I, I really recommend that book as a, a potential template for how these sorts of things could work. And uh, even if you're not a libertarian or a volunteerist or, or anybody of that you know, flavor of, of thought at all, you should still completely support what we're up to. Because let's say we managed to buy some land and set up a, you know, a free society and the whole thing completely fails and you know people are killing everybody and it just turns into an absolute mess then all these people that support the state and believe that the state is our you know lord and savior and without the state you know we would have an absolute mess of people killing each other you guys can all point to our free society as to what a mess it was and say that's right. why we should never try not having a government again so even if you think that we're completely off base and wrong you should still support our projects so the rest of you have something to point at our uh, at our, our failure but i i don't think we're going to fail i think it's going to wind up becoming a a, a worldwide a beacon of economic freedom and, and yeah i mean i i know i'd love to be on the first plane over there right now i think you're going to attract a lot of of human talent and capital you know, I was just having this conversation with a friend the other day. You know, why is it so expensive to live in Singapore? Why is it so expensive to live in Hong Kong? Because these places are perceived to have more freedom than other places. So the price of the property is going to get bid up in those places because of the demand for freedom. If, if we're trying to create more free areas or free societies, well, we've, we already have examples of not very free societies that are already being bid up the property value. So I think the demand is already inherent in society right now. As we see, I mean, Hong Kong's not free and Singapore's not free. They're gonna have more regulations than you can possibly count and more rules and laws than you can count. You know, So that leads me to the question, what is the template for free society? And like, how do you think that uh, property rights will play a role in setting the, I, don't, I, I guess I'll use the word legality, but just the framework of the, the laws or the agreements between people. So the idea isn't that we're not going to have any rules or we're not going to have any laws. The idea is that we're, we're going to have lots of rules, but no rulers. And so the, in the initial land title, and when we sell the, the land to people, it'll be built right in what the, the rules of the game are. And everybody that buys in will, will know what the rules of the game are from day one. And there isn't going to be some overall you know, ruler that gets to set and change the rules and, and change the rules of the game at any time for any reason, which is what we have in every nation state around the world at the moment. So uh, I don't think a group of people getting together and writing down words on a piece of paper altered morality in any way whatsoever. So the, the idea is to have this non-country based on the ideas of non-aggression and voluntarism and lay that out as the, you know, the, the, the rules of the game and then let people figure out how to achieve things from there. So I don't know how every little aspect is going to, to work. Uh, this isn't going to be a centrally planned economy or a centrally planned country. It's going to be freedom where free people can figure out how they want to solve problems in whatever way they want to solve it, so long as they're dealing with each other on a voluntary uh, basis. And nothing like that's ever been tried in the world before. But the, the places that have come closest to trying that sort of thing have been the most successful economically and have you know, the highest standard of living for the people there. So we're just going to take that to a whole other level. and. Uh, it's going to be really exciting to see how it plays out. It's going to be so exciting. And it kind of reminds me of how the United States was formed back in the day when there was you know, little to no federal government and little to no regulation and taxation. And look at the boom. Look at what the United States was able to do in such a short amount of time. You know, if you give freedom and the free market a chance 
to bloom, then it just, it's, it's like a explosion of wealth and opportunity for people that we really haven't been able to see, but in very short instances throughout history. And I'm really glad Roger, you know, I'm very appreciative that you're part of this and you're helping organize this because we need more examples than Somalia to point to for what people think a no government or no rulers type of society looks like. You know, I, if I'd never hear the question who will build the roads or why don't you move to Somalia again, it'll definitely be too early. Um, and I don't want to get into the, how will this be built? How will this be built? Because the beautiful thing about volunteerism is that we don't have to know, right? We don't have to know how defense is necessarily going to work or the roads or the courts or healthcare or public schools or any of this stuff because nobody's being forced to do anything and everybody's able to be entrepreneurs and be business people and be creative and try to solve the problems and the pains of society. You know, at its very essence, that's what entrepreneurship is. We're just trying to go out there and solve pains. Roger, what do you think some of the main hurdles are that are need to be addressed before this free society becomes the the free market based country or non country that we envision? Like, what what roadblocks do you see? Because I know you're leasing or buying, trying to buy this land from a sovereign government in and of itself. So, uh, the biggest roadblock, believe it or not, is uh, existing governments and existing governmental regulations. So right now we have more than $100 million of private capital committed, um, but we want to allow the public to participate as well. And we want to crowdfund more money via cryptocurrencies to do this. And unfortunately, there's all sorts of bureaucratic rules and regulations that are making that difficult to do. We would have launched already if not for these regulations. So we have a, a small team of lawyers trying to figure out the way that we can do that legally and not run afoul of the existing powers that be. Uh, and I think, and I'm pretty confident that we'll, this will be the biggest uh, crowdfunding thing ever. Uh, I, I don't think it's unreasonable to think that we'll raise over a billion dollars because if you look around the world, almost all the early cryptocurrency adopters are libertarian types that will absolutely <laughs> love this project. Right. Uh, and so, uh, you know, of course people are going to be excited in this. So as soon as we figure out, or as soon as the lawyers figure out the, the legal way for us to do this within the existing legal structure, we'll figure out a way to allow the public to participate. And then once we have, you know, a billion dollars worth of cryptocurrencies in the bank, I think some governments will be really, really interested in negotiating. And even with only a hundred million dollars uh, in the bank, we already uh, have quite a few people that are interested. Uh, yeah. It's in great ahead. that governments, you know, they are socialist by nature, all of them. And that means over time, the little economies that they try to run are going to become less and less uh, wealthy. And so governments will perpetually come into economic issues. And whenever they have problems, they're going to have to start selling off some of the assets that they stole from us to begin with, as sometimes those assets are land. And so, you know, when time equals infinity, it means that governments are going to have to gradually sell off and sell off these assets back to the marketplace or back to free people to try to you know, continue their scam going, their Ponzi scheme going. And so I, I wouldn't be surprised if you felt found several countries that would be willing to take, I mean, especially if you start talking about the billion mark, that's a, that pads the stats and calms the citizenry down a lot in a time of turmoil around the world. I mean, we see what's happening in Catalonia right now and throughout the United States, you know, there's a lot of angst building and I just hope that that angst is looked at vertically with the government seen as our oppressor rather than horizontally how the government and their mainstream media tries to, you know, portray us as enemies of each other. When in fact, the, it's, it's a vertical stack. It's the ruling class. That's the problem. That's, that's right. right. We need to do away with the, the, the entire idea of a ruling class, the entire idea that one small group of people get to boss around everybody else and tell them what they can and can't do. And if they were, everybody else disobeys that small group in the ruling class, they, they get hurt or sent to prison or, as we've seen in Catalonia, you know, police hit them with batons and all for sorts voting. of insanity for voting. So uh, the, the entire idea that one group of people has the right to rule over another group of people needs to be done away with. And the best way to do away with that is through education and podcasts and, and spreading those ideas and then providing people with the tools to just say no. Right. We remember Nancy Reagan saying, just say no to drugs. Well, let's just say no to a ruling and, class. And to everything. Like what, what should I not be able to say no to? Right. I mean, do I have the freedom to say no to anything I want to? And if not, why? Why can't I say no? It's amazing that, you know, nobody really understands voluntarism, but for the most part of people's lives, they live it every day. You, know, you go out to the restaurant 
nobody's forcing you to be there. Nobody's forcing you to order. Everything's peaceful. Everything's voluntary. But then there's this one small section of life where things aren't voluntary. But since public schools are one of the most successful businesses of all time, people aren't able to see the difference in a voluntary life and a non-voluntary life. And they think the non-voluntary life has to rule over the voluntary life in order to like protect us from something. It's, it's really strange. Um, speaking of regulations and licensing, just talk to us very quickly about how that not having centrally planned regulations and licensing is going to be a boon for the, the marketplace or the economy of free society. We don't know exactly how it's going to play out, but anybody will be free to start any business they want. It's peaceful. But there may very well be entrepreneurs that go out there and set up uh, private licensing systems where they give their stamp of approval to particular businesses that they've, you know, jumped through whatever hoops or met whatever certifications to ensure for their customers that that they're going to, you know, pr provide a safe product or, or what it is they need. And we already have lots of examples of that in the existing world with things like Underwriters Laboratory and a number of other cert private certification firms. So. I suspect there will be a big business opportunity uh, for things like that as well. So it's nice that we're going to have competition of, in it. Yeah. At the end of the day, we don't know exactly how it's going to be played out, but uh, that's the beauty of it. And there isn't any one size fits all solution to these sorts of things. Uh, let you know, may a thousand flowers bloom there. Let people try a thousand and one different experiments and figure out what works and what works for one people or one group of people might not work for another. So they should be free to try whatever it is that they want. Yeah, coming back to the cryptocurrency front, I, you had a quote in a recent written interview that said, uh, the free society is only possible because of cryptocurrencies. You know, what did you mean by that? And how are more opportunities available now that we have cryptographically backed or math backed free market money rather than only having precious metals? So we, we plan to raise you know, at least hundreds of millions of additional dollars worth of capital for this free society project. And before cryptocurrency, that wouldn't have really been possible with, with normal banks or PayPal or credit cards or that sort of thing. There's just way too much friction with all those. Whereas now, thanks to the invention of cryptocurrencies, we can you know, fundraise from the entire world and people can do it privately as well. People can donate money to this project uh, without any anything for that matter um, from a technical standpoint. I don't know what the, the lawyers and, and politicians and police will have to say about that, but that's the fact of the matter of the world we live in today. Anybody can send any amount of money to anybody else. And uh, if they want to, they can do it privately at this point. Yes, it's really wonderful. Um, what type of people do you expect are going to be attracted to this free society? Are you looking at entrepreneurs, digital nomads, libertarians, or is it in anybody or you just have no expectations? Uh, it's, I guess, anybody that's interested in the ideas of non-aggression. Um, we've already actually had the office of one particular billionaire with a B reach out to us who's very interested in our project. And they were uh, exploring ways how they could be uh, supportive and helpful to what we're up to. So that's a, that's a pretty interesting sign that that's already happening. So uh, I, I think this is going to be a, a real success and, and maybe a bit of a turning point in human history. You know, in, in modern times, certainly nothing like this has ever existed ever before. So it's going to be really exciting to see uh, just how this plays out. So just like the invention of, of Bitcoin was a bit of a turning point for the world, uh, maybe this is gonna be a bit of a turning point for the world and the rest of the world will suddenly see, oh, maybe we don't need a bunch of rulers to rule over us and things go awfully well when we don't have a ruling class. And uh, you know, maybe the rest of the world will, will start seeing that as an example to, to follow. Yeah, I'll start wrapping up here, Roger. Um, you know, as a libertarian for over a decade now, I know that there's been other types of uh, projects like this to try to create a, a space for us to live freely, like uh, the seasteading project or Liberland. You know, how is free society similar but different than these these previous projects? Um, so, it's it is similar and it is different at the same time and that of the beauty of it is we shouldn't try the same thing over and over and over again especially if it's not working um so i fully support seasteading i've been a fan of seasteading for i don't know i read about it almost 20 years ago now at this point i think probably around the year 2000 ish or so um more power to them i hope they succeed uh uh liverland i'm a giant fan of liverland too i've, I've been helping them uh every way I can. I'm actually one of the first Liberland pass, uh, passport holders. I've been helping them financially and I'll, I'll help them as much as I can. And I hope they succeed as well. Another 
strategy that's worth mentioning as well is uh, Adam Kokesh is running for not president of the United States in 2012. And his platform is, uh, if he's elected, it'll be an orderly dissolution of the United States federal government. Right. And I think there are a lot of people, not just in the U.S., but around the world who would love that to happen. And if you stop and think for, for a moment, it's not going to change the way most people live their lives. You're still going to have the state governments and local you know, county and city governments as well. But uh, the one that's really causing the problems around the world is the federal government. So imagine if Adam Kokesh were to be elected and manage to, you know, have an orderly dissolution of the federal government, everybody's lives would be so much better off and you'd, you'd be able to completely do away with these uh, federal income taxes and all these federal taxes and you'd have way much more, way more money to spend at the local level. So that's another great strategy for achieving more economic freedom and, and human liberty around the world. So we should try all of these things and try all of them in parallel. And if even one of them works, then the whole world's a better place because of it. Yeah, it's like cryptocurrencies. Let's try all of these experiments in parallel. I don't understand all this hate that we have, you know, internally for all the cryptocurrencies. Like free market money, competition in money is wonderful. Competition in freedom and non-countries or not presidents or building on top or under the water or homesteading land between Croatia and Serbia or leasing it or buying it from a sovereign government. We don't know what's going to work. And that's the beautiful part of entrepreneurship. And that's, you know, why I started Liberty Entrepreneurs is we're trying to build our freedom. We're not begging for it. We're not asking for it. We're trying to actively go out and see how we can build our societies in a peaceful manner. Roger, do you have any sneak peeks or any roadmap that you can spill on us here? For a free society? Um, you'll have to stay tuned at freesociety.com. Go, go and sign up for our mailing list. And uh, I guess the, it's not a big, big secret, but at some point we're going to be opening this up to where the public can participate as well. So if you want to be the, one of the first people to know about it, sign up for our mailing list at uh, freesociety.com. Freesociety.com. Roger, thank you so much for coming to Liberty Entrepreneurs. I really appreciate your time. Best of luck to you, Roger. Let me know how I can support you. And I, I just really appreciate your, your motivation. You, you're constantly passionate about individual freedom. And you know, just, just keep crushing it out there, man. Thank you. Thank you, Ash. Yep. See you, Roger.